video is going to be on the Hanbo, also known as the San Giacomo. The Hanbo is a very interesting weapon. I don't believe any other systems outside of the Nimpo world really focuses on the Hanbo any longer. It's a very unique weapon. <clears throat> the Hanbo is a three foot staff. The San Jakubo, Jaku, is a measurement of length in Japanese. It's basically 12 inches. So San, each knee San, three, 12 inch sections, 36 inches, three foot staff. <clears throat> so the Hanbo is one term for it. San Jakubo is another term for it. But it's a very unique weapon. I have a traditional one here. This is what a traditional three foot staff would look like. And for myself being six foot two, I don't have any room above my hand to be able to grab or be able to do anything. So I have to be able to drop my knees to be able to get a small portion of the bow. Uh, in Japan with the Japanese people, you know, they're already starting here. And when they drop their hands down, they've got enough to be able to move, to be able to strike with. So when I seen that, I went and had a Hanbo I went and had a Hanbo custom made for my height. So now when I'm in regular position and I drop my knees, I have the same ability to grab the bow as the Japanese. <clears throat> so I had this cut for me and I would recommend playing around with it. You know what I mean? So if you're a taller American or a Westerner and you've got a little bit more height on you and you're up around the top of the bow and you've got to do something really ridiculous to be able to get your grip on it, just uh, go ahead and get a wooden dowel and have it measured out. So you've got at least one fist from the natural standing position, at least one fist. So when I do drop my knees down and I bring my hand here, when I get this position here, it's exactly the same position as I would be if I had a Kukishinru sword. Uh, the Kukishinru sword has a little bit longer of a handle, a little bit longer of a blade. It's very unique as far as a sword is concerned. But that's another day. <clears throat> but this is the uh, Hanbo, and there's three Kamai. The first Reho, or bowing with it, obviously you can bow to it with the here as a presentation. You can bow, you can bow to the sun. You can always say onegeshimasu. You can bow to a training partner, onegeshimasu. That's one way. Another way to bow is having it in the traditional bojutsu position here, and bowing here. So if I was to take it off of the rack, then I would bow, pay respect, let's get in front of a partner, come here, and then I can take my training. But the first Kamai is called Katayaburi. You want to have three even sections, palms down on both hands, knees bent, back straight, and you want to have the hambo about one fist or so from the body. So it's not touching your body, and it's not too far out. Kind of hanging naturally, about one fist from your body. And just like with all the other bojutsu, your index fingers are very relaxed. You're holding it basically with your three fingers and your thumb, and you're here. Katayaburi. The feeling of katayaburi is trying to break your opponent's form. The majority of the techniques with the Hanbo are done against Taijutsu, someone who's unarmed with no weapon, or it's going to be someone with a sword or a, or a small wakasashi, so a bladed weapon, anything from a tanto all the way up to a katana or something that's unarmed fighting just with their hands. That's what the Hanbo would be used for. The Hanbo is the same size as a joe, so it's not like it was a yari, a big spear, that was hacked down and you're just left with a small wooden staff. That's what the Roshakabo started off of. The Roshakabo, Roshakabo is here, started off as a spear. And then the blade of either the spear or the naginata was cut off by a swordsman. And you were just left with the staff and he was coming with the sword, you had to be able to defend yourself. The Hambo, think of it more along the lines of like a walking stick, <clears throat> a walking stick. Um, this is a non-threatening type of a weapon, just kind of a wooden dowel. Um, the ninja would carry it around as a way of, of protection, um, but it didn't look too much like a weapon. So that he could disguise himself as maybe an old man or maybe someone who was 
hurt or handicapped and people would leave him alone and he'd be able to travel from town to town. So the hambo is not something like a war broke out and somebody's like, well, hey, let me go grab my, my stat uh, and take this into battle. <clears throat> it wasn't that way. So it was basically a weapon that would be used on the streets, uh, something that would be disguised, something that would be walking stick, uh, a small uh, thing that you could put on your back and you could put your baskets and you could carry baskets. And it was a very common thing and did not bring attention to anybody. All right, so the Hamba is a very unique weapon. And I think Nimpo is probably one of the few systems left that study it as a traditional weapon. And this comes from Kuki Shinru. So again, Katiyabari to break your opponent's form. The next Kamai is called Munen Muso. Munen Muso. Munen Muso is kind of like a Shizen position. It's a natural standing position here. You want to have the Hambo a little bit out in front of your feet. You don't want to have it like right next to your body like maybe you would with like a rifle. You want to have it a little bit out in front of you. <clears throat> there is going to be times where you're going to take it, you're going to kick this weapon up. So if it was outside of your feet, there would be really difficult ways for you to be able to do this. So it's just out in front, maybe 45 degrees from your middle toe, and just kind of out there relaxed. This is Munen Musou, to be one with nature. And a lot of people talk to be one with nature, like, Sensei, what does that mean to be one with nature? You know, am I supposed to like grow roots out of my feet? Am I supposed to like have birds land on my head? Like, what does it mean? Am I supposed to have like this, this blank mushin, like no thought in my mind? Am I supposed to just be here like, duh, and nothing's going on in my brain? I get all kind of crazy answers. <clears throat> or should I say crazy questions? But when they say being one with nature or being mushin, no thought, no mind, no heart, it doesn't mean that you're being like just completely relaxed where you're not in tune or in touch with your surroundings. To be one with nature is to be one in that environment, in that spot. So if I'm outdoors and I am in, in a nature environment and I have opponents getting ready to fight me, I need to be very relaxed and very calm so I can feel if I'm jerky and I'm anxious, I'm cutting away the ability to sense and to feel attacks. So I want to be relaxed. I like to tell people that you're going to put 1% of your mind on 100% of everything around you. There's a word called tendrils. It's kind of a psychic connection. I want you to be connected to everything around you. Trees. Grass, mountains, clouds, opponents, rocks, just to be balanced with it. If I'm in a city environment, if I'm in a downtown city environment, to be one with nature is going to be one within that city environment. There's going to be taxi cabs and buses and traffic and people and noise and sounds and construction. That's all part of that nature. That's a very natural sound in that environment. So if I was some crazy person going to fight in some middle city street, and I take this Kamai, I'm going to try to relax. I'm not going to let the buses distract me, the taxis distract me, the people walking around, the people across the street, the construction that's going on, the sounds of a loud city street. I'm not going to let my mind be distracted by any one thing. I'm going to keep that solid baseline. No matter if I'm in the middle of a river and a stream and in a beautiful forest, or if I'm in a downtown urban area, if I'm in a war zone where there's things blowing up around me, all those things are gonna make a baseline. And I'm gonna be even with that baseline. So when it says to be one with nature, you need to be balanced and in tune with your surroundings, no matter what those surroundings are. So when I take this position, I'm not gonna let anything distract me. I'm focused not on one thing, but 100% to everything. It's going to be relaxed. Not just what I can see, but what's behind me, what's above me, what's below me. I'm going to try to be in tune so I can sense and feel when that natural rhythm changes. When something changes in that natural rhythm. So I have to be calm. I have to be relaxed. I have to be feeling. I have to be plugged in. I have to be in tune. So I can't be like focused on 50% of what's going on in front of me. 
then I'd be attacked from behind or from above and I wouldn't sense that danger. So you need to be relaxed. And that takes discipline, that takes training, that takes courage in the face of danger for you to relax, to absorb, to connect, and to feel, and to be patient. It's a skillful tech. A lot of people when they're in danger, they have this fight or flight thing and they either wanna just jump right into the fight or they wanna just run away. In some cases, you're gonna to have to be able to absorb the energy of your opponent, absorb the energy of surroundings, connect to it. So when that energy changes, you can interpret it as danger or something friendly, something that you need to focus on, something that's part of that natural rhythm that you don't need to pay attention to. And the only way to do that is to be in tune or to be one with nature or your natural surroundings. So hopefully that helps you when you know you go to, when I go to Japan, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, this is uh, the Japanese too. Uh, this is Munemuzo. And I'm like, okay, Munemuzo. And they'll say, to be one with nature. Like, oh, cool, to be one with nature. What the fuck does that mean, to be one with nature? They never tell you, you know what I mean? So it's taken me years and years and years, again, little tidbits here, little tidbits here, little tidbits here, saying, what does it mean to be one with nature, sensei? And asking instructor after instructor after instructor, and getting either from bullshit answers that I obviously didn't know, or somebody really trying to help you, but they're just not in touch with the way the American mind thinks. You know, they'll talk about like feeling like you're floating through space. Well, if you're not an astronaut, how do you know what it feels like to be floating through space? Does it feel like I'm dreaming? Does it feel like I'm flying? So <clears throat> over the time, I really narrowed it down to the word to be one of nature meant more to be part of a natural environment. Whatever that environment is, that environment's gonna have a baseline and you need to be connected and to be one with that. So when someone says to be no mind, no thought, mu shin, or to have an emptiness about you, it's not like an empty bucket. It's being empty, it's being neutral, so you can receive, so you can transmit, to be neutral. So when you see one with nature, think of that as your natural environment, what's ever natural around you, whether it be urban or in a, a wooded environment, and not to just be dull and blank and just like relax like you're meditating, you're gonna go to sleep, that's gonna get you killed. You just need to be patient, calm, and perceptive. And you need to not react to everything around you. You can't be like jerk. You have to absorb and you have to be able to have the experience to know whether that's danger or that's something that's not something you should worry about right now. That's the, not the most important thing you should be focused on. And that's hard because I'm contradicting myself because even though I'm being very natural and I'm relaxed, I need to be in tune with everything around me. When that baseline changes, I need to be aware of it. And I need to be able to deduce whether that's danger or not. And again, a lot of blindfolded training uh, or even having your eyes open and having someone walk up behind you and reach out and have them walk up kind of quietly and just kind of touch you on your shoulder and then have them do it with two different types of intent. Have them walk up with the intent that they're going to just hammer you in the back of the head and they're thinking that, and they're, they're transmitting their soul, this anger, this violence, this ability just to crush you in the back of the head. So as they're walking towards you, that's what they're thinking. And you're just kind of relaxed, and you've got this baseline. And all of a sudden, you're gonna hear them come up behind you, but you know they're coming. But now you've got to feel, you've got a sense, you have to be in tune, you have to be plugged in. And then your body, it's in there, trust me, your body is gonna sense that danger. Use the back palms of your hands. Use the back part of your neck. Use your chakras. Feel, push, relax. And when you feel that danger, almost like you feel like you should be leaning forward, like your body is already telling you, hey, it's time to move. And you're feeling that just, there's danger coming. Turn around and face that person in a comma. Like just turn around and face them in a, in a, in a comma. And then the, and have them do it another person or have them do it a different time where they just walk up with, very calm, peaceful, relaxed, say, hey, I'm walking up to my friend, they're very relaxed, relaxed, and they just reach their hand out and naturally touch your shoulder with no energy, no aggression, no danger, no evil thoughts, just peace, kindness, friendship, warmth. So again, the third or fourth time they walk up to you, you hear them coming, you sense them coming, but it's different. You don't feel that anger, you don't feel that energy, you don't feel that, that, that gut feeling that you're in trouble, you know what I mean? You may still drift forward because your body's letting you know that something's coming. You're gonna to have to learn to fight that with discipline, but you're gonna see a difference. 
And when that person walks up and touches you, or gets ready to touch you on your shoulder, just raise your hand the second before they touch you. Just raise your hand and look at them. You know what I mean? And look at them. And if they're walking towards you with a killer tent, they should come up with their fist behind you and get ready to pound you in your head. And if you don't move, boom, they just punch you in your shoulder or punch you in your back. And if they walk up very relaxed and they come up, just bring their hand up and just touch you on the shoulder. That's a type of drill that you can use to develop to be one with nature. All right. So that coup down or that insight uh, is, is rare to get. And uh, that's worth anything you've invested right there. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Cut the ivory to break your opponent's form. Mude Musou to be one with nature. O Tanashi. O Tanashi. Fingers are up. So your palms are not facing you, they're facing away. Facing away. And your hand is relaxed. So your palms are facing away and your hands are relaxed. <clears throat> and again, you want to keep the bow a little bit away from your body. You want to be able to be able to move this. So you don't want it under, you want it out so you can move it, right? <clears throat> because from here, you're going to learn how to do over-the-top draws. You're going to learn how to move and strike both different ways by changing your grip, right? So, and old tanashi means to make your opponent do something rash. Um, if your opponent has a sword and they're coming towards you, and I'm here in Katayabari, he sees that I'm ready to defend myself. But as he's coming closer, if I was to move and go to this position here, he's probably going to think I'm crazy, or he's going to think I'm showing off. And, he, and he's probably going to say, hey, this fool is doing something stupid. I'm going to try to take advantage of this, and I'm going to attack. I'm going to attack right now. So maybe with this position here, they're, they're very calm. They're going to maybe walk around you. You're going to stay calm. And then all of a sudden, you change. You change to Otanashi. Now, when you make this move to Otanashi, you need to know that in the mentality of your attacker, he's feeling that you've done something stupid. He feels he has an opening. He feels he has an opportunity to attack. He's probably going to be coming. So the second you take Otanashi, you better be able to receive, ready to receive, whatever attack they come with. So there's only three kamais, kukishin, hamujutsu. Katiyabari, break your opponent's form. Munen muso, to be one with nature. Otanashi, to make your opponent do something rash. So these are the three kamais, kukishin, ru, hamujutsu. And again, you need to know when to take katiyabari. I'm going to take Katiyabari to break my opponent's form. So what, what, does, what does that mean? If I'm in Munemuso, probably where I would start, I'm sensing danger, maybe I'm surrounded, maybe someone's coming, maybe I had this as kind of like a walking stick naturally, so rather than just being in any old position, that my brain is not sensing that it needs to take a specific attitude, I'm going to change from whatever position I was in, to Munen Muso. Now my brain and my soul, my body knows that this is a Kamai, this has a proper attitude, and I've trained from this position, and my body knows how to move from this position. So it's very important not to change things around a little bit, and then think you're going to be able to move the way you've trained. <clears throat> you've trained from this position, so you want to fight from this position. Now three, Munen Muso, Otanashi. Kamai section. This is section three. Technique number one is Naname Omote Waki Uchi. Naname <clears throat> Omote Waki Uchi is kind of like a lot of terminology to basically say that I'm moving in a certain direction. I'm going to either be moving backwards, I'm going to be moving forward, I'm going to be moving to the outside, I'm going to be moving to the inside, and I'm going to be striking. And this one here, Naname Omote Waki Uchi, I'm actually going to be moving Naname, which means diagonally backwards, right? <clears throat> so from Katayabari, I'm going to be able to move diagonally backwards and move on to the Omote means that I'm striking to the outside. And if I go Ura, that means I'm striking to the inside. 
but from Katia Bari, <clears throat> diagonally backwards, stepping backwards, and as I with my leg, my hand moves in unison. So this is moving together. And then what I'm going to do is, right as this foot hits the ground, I'm going to be grounding this into my hip. I'm going to be using the tip of this to strike into the opponent's target, either to the Jodan, Chudan, or the Gedan, or to the Menuchi, the Do, or the Ashi. But here, moving, striking here, which would be Jodan. Chudan. Gedan. That was moving to the outside. Because if my opponent's punching in, I'm gonna be striking to the outside of his body. The next section, naname ora waki uchi, is I'm gonna be moving naname diagonally, but I'm gonna be striking to the opposite side. Same thing as I move 45 degrees, striking here to the head, ribs, knees. So his opponent is either cutting in punching in, I'm stepping out. If he's punching to the chew that area or stabbing with a knife in the stomach, I'm going to bring this over top and strike to the face. Right? And again, I'm moving 45 degrees backwards and grounding either at my hip or at my chest. I want this grounded to my body. Sometimes the hip takes it away. I can get further away, ground to my body. The most important thing is whether it's not the chest or the hip is that you're pulling into your body because this is going to generate the other end's speed. I'm punching with this hand and pulling with this hand. So I'm not just doing one hand and I'm not just doing this. It's a combination of that pull and push. Almost like you see a karate guy who's pulling and pushing. This is the same thing, how I generate my speed to get the attack. So if you do the first technique and the second technique as like a drill. It would be stepping back, each, knee, sun, she, go, rook. And that would be all three levels on both sides. So that's 45 degrees backwards, naname, omote, ura, Waki Uchi. Waki Uchi basically means I'm going to be striking targets to the outside or to the inside of the body. Lower floating ribs, temple, knees are your targets. It's technique one and two. Real quickly, the last one was Naname Ushiro. Ushiro means diagonally backwards. This one is going to be Naname Omote waki uchi, like I said last time. But the, the first the first two, naname ushiro. Ushiro is that 45 degrees backwards. This is uh, naname omote waki uchi. Basically what I'm doing is I'm going to be stepping forward, right? So as the attack is coming in, I'm going to be stepping forward and striking to jodan, chudan, geidan. And that's for the omote side, the Ura side, Jodan, Chudan, Gedan. Right? So if the person is attacking and coming forward, maybe a big leaping Jodan, I may need to go backwards to hit. If it's a quick movement, I may be able to just go forward and hit. So this skill set is teaching us how to move in all directions. Naname, forward. Omote, ura. Omote, ura. Omote, ura. Jodan, jodan. Chudan, chudan. Gedan, gedan. And just learning how to move when you step is part of the training. And then grounding. So you've got power in your strikes. Being able to go both either forward or backwards with your strikes is the first four techniques. Technique number five is Han Gaishi Uchi. 
the word Han, like in the sense of Han Do, Han basically means half. So this is basically half of a Roshakubo. So that's kind of how it's got its nickname, Hanbo. It's half of a Roshakubo. So it being six foot, it's three foot. So this Han Gaishi Uchi. Gaishi is kind of like a reversal or a twist or something that goes from this position to that position. The bow is turning over or it's kind of reversing. So Gaishi, you see Mawashi, use terms like that. That means the bow is actually turning over or something's actually rotating. So in this one here, as the attack comes in, I'm going to move it 45 degrees backwards. And then I'm going to flick this with this hand. And this hand is going to quickly turn over. And I'm going to catch Han Gaishi Uchi. Moving 45 degrees backwards. And it's using my weight to sink down. If the opponent's cutting down, this will be striking down to the wrist to break the wrist. And from here, using the hombo leg catches it. Han Gaishi Uchi. This is technique number six, Kote Mawashi Katate. Starting again from Kate Abari. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step 45 degrees forward, left and right which is called Sayu. Someone says Sayu, that means to do it left side and right side. If they say Migi, go to your right. If they say Hidori, go to your left. If they say Sayu, that means they want to see it from the right side and the left sides or both sides. So this is a Sayu, right? So basically what I'm thinking about doing is an Omote Shuto with one hand. So as I bring the hand, the humble up, I'm going to come with a little 45 degree angle. This is showing as like a little bit of a block. And this is coming over top of my head, this foot stepping, and this is striking. So it's a one-handed strike. One, two. All in one motion, here. Bringing this under, guarding here, protecting here, striking. Any open target, any open target. <clears throat> If he's coming in with a step, I'd come here and I can strike to the knees. If he's coming with a sword cut, I'd come here and I can strike down to the wrist. I can come here and I can strike to the temple. I can come here and I can strike down to the top of the head. But it's basically a one hand rotating strike. One hand rotating strike. Any open target. Katate Kata te means, kata means form, te meaning hand, one hand, each, e, song, she, go, broke, sich, punch, Ku, Ju. Technique number seven is called O Mawashi. O Mawashi. Anytime you see the word O, the letter O, <clears throat> Pasha be something. It's symbolizing that whatever's coming after the word O is going to be big or it's going to be grand. O Soto Gake, big O Soto. O Soto Gari, uh, O Moashi, you know what I mean? Uh, you'll even hear people uh, talk about uh, Moyoweshi, but O Sensei, a uh, great big, a uh, big large man, just a big Sensei. But O Moashi basically means we're going to do the same thing we did last time, but we're going to make it a much more grander, much more larger attack. In some cases, 
This is someone's attacking very fast forward. And what I've got to be able to do is move way back to really exaggerated motion, right? I can come forward with it as well. But it's a very big, I'm extending where the other one is I'm here and I'm striking here. My elbow is a certain distance from my body. With uh, Omo, with Omowashi, I'm actually coming way forward. And I'm really extending my legs. Elbows much farther away from my body. And the other one, I'm very tight. Omowashi is very big. Stepping backwards, way backwards. I'm even taking my head somehow. Leaning way far backwards here. So this is a grander, larger motion than the other. Just much bigger. Raising this up. Uh, bigger strike. Oh, Mawashi. Right? So the other one, tight. Oh, Mawashi. Big. Much more grander in scope. Oh, Mawashi. This is number eight, it is skeet. Skeet is a thrust. So with the hambo, starting in katayabari, I'm going to move offline, and then I'm going to skeet, right? So the bow itself is going to do some type of a parry block, pull back to the end, step, and thrust the backhand. Pull back to Katayabari, come here, move, pull, thrust, back, come on. Sometimes you'll see me just take the back end up and skeet, almost like a, uh, a pull ball break. Um, you don't want to leave the hambo out here. So anytime that you're thrusting, with any of the weapons, it's going to be a pull and a push back. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit you, but I don't want to leave this out there for you to be able to manipulate my balance. So I want to make sure that when I make this move and I thrust, I'm coming back. This is just coming in and hitting into the face, moving off, hitting into the hand, poking into the face. So katate skeet is offline, thrust. Offline, Thrust. Left hand's a little off balance there. H. Knee. So. She. Go. Rope. Sich. Hutch. Number nine is katate ski. Again, starting in katayabari. And as you notice, the whole section started in katayabari. I'm going to do relatively the same thing by moving offline. This time, I'm going to have my left hand, or when I move this direction, my right hand, being able to deflect, control, manipulate something. And with katate, katate, one singular hand, I'm going to thrust probably up underneath the punch, coming into the chin, to the sternum, or to the face, to the eye, to the temple, to the ribs. Whatever target my opponent gives me. Some people ask, Sensei, what target should I hit with this attack? Well, what target did your opponent give you? If you limit yourself to saying, well, this works best, straight and crushes the Adam's apple. I agree, it's very effective. What if his chin is down and the target has to be perfect to hit that? So I can't get his throat. But I can break into like the lower ribs to hurt his body. Maybe I can come into the side of the neck and try to crush an artery. Maybe he's giving the temple his eye 
Maybe his mouth is open. I can bust his teeth out. I'm going to take whatever target, Q show, weak spot that my opponent gives me. Does that give you free reign to do whatever you want, whenever you want? Yes. As long as you're attacking a proper Q show. If I say, what did you, where did you hit him at? And you're like, I hit him over here somewhere. Well, what part of over here somewhere? Well, I, I think I hit his chest muscle. Well, why would you hit a big muscle when you can hit a lower floating rib that can break easily? Well, the guy was 100 pounds overweight and I didn't feel I could get that target. So I went into the spot between the chest muscle and the body and I tried to separate the chest muscle. Okay, you're thinking, I'm cool with that. But if you're just like randomly poking a stick around at somebody and just hoping you hit something, I can't accept that. You have to study the cue shows, you have to study the weak points. So when that punch or that attack comes in, I'm using this to defend myself, protect myself, push, manipulate, catch, and then use this tip to strike either to the groin, to the kage, the belly button, you know, sui getsu, the solar plexus, up into the uko, into the throat, into the eye. If his head is turned to the kasumi or the temple, I'm just, I'm not just gonna stick this out and hope it hits something. When I make this move, I'm going to see really quickly what he's giving me and strike it, okay? And then again, I'm not going to overextend and leave this out there. This is going to strike and it's going to come back. So he can't catch, grab, block, manipulate that. If he hits this, he can take my balance. So if he hits and takes my balance, I want to have this back here. I don't want him to be able to manipulate it and throw it away. So as that attack comes in, moving, striking, single hand. Moving, striking. Whatever target he gives me. All right, katate skeet. Number 10, uchi kuten. Uchi kuten is like a rolling, striking flip. So uchi kuten, some attack is coming. I'm going to parry the center part of the bow, or the top part of the bow, or even the bottom part of the bow. I'm going to move offline. And I'm telling you right now, there's going to be very, 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 maybe never times where I'm going to tell you to stand right here when a person's attacking you. When a person's attacking you, you must move offline. All right, you're either coming forward on an angle, backwards on an angle, <clears throat> but you're getting off this center line of any type of an attack. You're moving offline. If you learn to move offline, you're gonna be in a lot better shape. I've seen people try to do jodans without moving 45 degrees, and they're a little bit late, and they get punched in the face. I've seen people that are a little bit late, they move 45 degrees, the block wasn't efficient, but their face is still intact. 45 degrees, getting offline, do it, period. <clears throat> Uchi kuten. One, two, letting go. Pinching between the thumb and the rest of my fingers. This is going to allow the bow to rotate to about this position here. And I'm gonna catch my fingers on top, squeeze my fist, and that's what makes the bow come down. So it looks like that. I'm going to move, strike, push, make a tight fist, and lock my wrist in place. That gives me the strike. Attack comes in, I parry it, I hit it, and I break it. So it's block, strike, hit. Block, strike, hit. Block, hit. And just learn to get this moving fluidly. So you're blocking, hitting, blocking, hitting, and the bow stays in motion. Uchi, kuten. It may take you a little while to get it down, but if you break it down, it's one, two, three. 
one, two, three. And you've got to learn to let this, don't grab it. You've got to learn to let it spin in your hand. So you've got to pinch and let that spin and then catch. Spin, catch, spin, catch. Yeah, you can do it with your hand, but you really got to get this elbow over and you see this here. Well, I'm doing now I can bring this very vertical, right? So if I had to do this technique tight, where I had other warriors on both sides of me, and I'm in the center, and I can still do this technique by bringing it close to my body. Where if I keep my grip tight, it's very difficult to have already hit this guy. Or if I'm tight against a wall, say I'm tight here, I can move this and use it where I'm tight. Where I'm not going to hit nothing. Where if I try to do that with a fist closed, I'm, I can't do it. I would be over here and I'd be hitting the wall. You know? Or if there was an opponent over here fighting next to me and I tried to do this technique with one hand, I'm gonna hit him or get his leg. So by having the fingers pinched allows me to keep the bow tight to my body. Right? Tight to my body. Uchi kute. It's going to take a little practice, but you'll get it done.